My presentation is about S9 guideline, non-clinical evaluation for anti-cancer pharmaceuticals. This is the table of contents. The overview, test for non-clinical test, non-clinical data for clinical test design and marketing authorization and others. In the uh, overview, I'll be talking about the uh, purposes, background, scope um, of the guideline. And for the second um, section, uh, the test for non-clinical evaluation, uh, there is a list of the tests. And when we design clinical tests, how these data is used and what kind of studies are required will be covered. Now, let me begin. S9 guideline was approved by ICH steering committee um, on the 29th of October 2009 as step four document. This is information to help designing appropriate non-clinical test for anti-cancer drugs. This uh, anti-cancer is for advanced cancer patients where options are limited. For example, uh, patients um, who do not see the benefits of existing um, cancer treatment. The purpose of the guidance is to facilitate the development of anti-cancer drugs, protect patients from unnecessary AE, and minimize unnecessary animal tests. The specific characteristics are reflected since we are dealing with anti-cancer and other general principles of ICH guideline could be refer uh, could be also referenced. Background of this guideline cancer is life-threatening disease. It has high uh, uh, fatality, and there is a limited effectiveness of existing treatment. So it is important to provide new anti-cancers as soon as possible to patients. The objective of non-clinical test is first to understand pharmacological characteristics of drug products and to make sure that the initial dose is set at an appropriate level to minimize the exposure and also to understand target organ exposure reaction relations and reversibility of drug products in terms of toxicology. Unlike other drug products, in case of anti-cancer products, it's dealing with advanced disease and it's a fatal disease. And these cancer patients participate from the beginning and the dose given can include a dose which can cause AE. So these are the differences uh, compared to other non-clinical tests. So for designing non-clinical tests for anti-cancers, there are other aspects, uh, for example, the timing and the types of tests. In the latter part, uh, we'll be talking about considerations for the test. So, uh, you can get more detailed information about the differences. Next, scope. As I explained before, this guideline is targeting cancer patients, but not all the can cancer uh, patients. Only those uh, life-threatening advanced uh, cancer patients. and it includes small molecule and biopharmaceuticals. 
and regardless of the route of administration, the guideline is applied. And in designing non-clinical testing, the minimum considerations for initial clinical um, test must be identified. The list of non-clinical test items required for clinical test is identified. And the additional non-clinical test um, required for coronary cancer patients are discussed. Preventive oncomedicines and uh, the test material for healthy people, vaccines, cell treatment, gene treatment, and radio pharmaceuticals are not out, are outside of the scope. So they are not in the scope. Let's go into more details. There is a list of um, non-clinical tests, starting with pharmacological test to photo safety. Non-clinical test data is for IMD submission and NDA information. And those information must be submitted in CTD format. All these information must be documented following this format. So the structure and the format must be understood. The non-clinical parts in CTD, there are three sections. For that two, that one, pharmacology, for that two, that two, PK study, for that two, that three, toxicology. For pharmacology, there is a detailed classification. And for P, so pharmacology related data is the first section, and the second is pharmacokinetics. And safety information belongs to toxicology. The PK data includes method and validation and ADME. Lastly, in toxicology, there is a detailed classification to it, right? Single dose, repeated dose, genotoxicity, carcinogenicity, reproductive and developmental toxicity, local tolerance, and other toxicity studies. For photo safety and um, general toxicity, there are additional information. First, pharmacological test. It starts from phase one, and the drug is given to cancer patients. So the efficacy must be expected, and the therapeutic dose is given. So the similar level of pharmacological test data with general drug is required. Anti-cancer activity and a mechanism of action and administration schedule is required. Depending on the target and the mechanism of action of the drug, appropriate disease model must be used. But the tumor type can vary. Uh, for example, brain tumor cannot be sampled easily, so it doesn't necessarily require the usage of the um, identical cell line. The mandatory information to be included is as follows. So Non-clinical proof of principle, administration schedule, and dose escalation schedule. Unlike general drug products, where approved dose is a given, Depending on the target cancer and on the situation of the patients, the schedule and dose escalation plan may vary.
So non-clinical data must support these differences. Selection of animal species. We have to select appropriate species and initial dose and biomarker to be measured in clinical study must be included in the non-clinical studies. And concomitant therapy must be looked at usually. For cancer treatment, uh, multiple drugs are used at the same time. And to support human safety, secondary uh, uh, pharmacological test data could, uh, may be required. Safety pharmacology for general product before phase one, each test are done separately and uh, battery test is done. This is information from the general drug. Core battery test, CNS respiratory CV tests are done. CNS is for central neural system. Rodent testi testing is usually done for respiratory. Respiratory rate and tidal volume are tested using rodent. For cardiovascular, in vitro assay using HERG is included, and in vivo system is also included. So there are four tests in core battery. In case of cancer product, there is an addition of repeated dose toxicity vital organ function test. For non Rodent telemetric study can be only done with non rodents in combination ther therapies. After the drug is given, detailed monitoring and ECG monitoring um, is enough for non rodent repeated dose toxicity test. But even in this combination test, when there are serious uh, dysfunction, according to S7, um, additional pharmacological test may be required. Next, PK study. PK uh, study is re required to have minimum animal PK parameters for those uh, selection and administration scheduling and those escalation. For general drug products, ADME study and other information uh, need to be submitted. For metabolite, uh, there are detailed explanation later. Uh, for unique human metabolite, there are no additional tests required. Important points to consider is first general toxicity test. So there are two types of tests for advanced pan cancer patients, objective is safety evaluation. The dose used can include maximum tolerated dose and dose limiting toxicity. So in repeated dose toxicity, uh, NOIL and NOIR are identified, but not here. And the toxicity test design must consider the uh, clinical administration scheduling. So uh, please refer to the general protocol for the toxicity test. Next, recovery group. It is necessary to have a recovery group. For anti-cancer group, because we use similar dose with clinical exposure, when serious uh, toxicity is expected and recovery cannot be 
uh, estimated, the recovery group must be um, selected before phase one. For general drug products, uh, it is required to have NOEL set up and recovery group. So what is important here is that Next, the selection of animal species. In case of chemical, just like general drug products, um, it's usually non one rodent and one non-rodent. And it's the same here. For chemical, one rodent and one non-rodent. But uh, in special cases, cytotoxic chemical compound, the toxicity is uh, known. In this case, uh, if it's uh, if it shows efficacy with one rodent, you can just have one rodent. For non-rodent repeated dose toxicity for each group, three units and two for recovery group. This is the same as uh, general drug products and whether to include recovery group or not can vary case by case. And for toxicity tests, both sexes must be used. But for anti-cancer with justification, just one sex uh, can be used for the test. The justification includes the similar level of exposure and the similar level of toxicity. So no difference between different sexes uh, will justify the usage of only one sex for the test. The animal species selection for biopharmaceuticals must uh, be based upon ICHS6. For biopharmaceuticals, relevant species must be selected and when we say relevant, MOE of the toxicity can be applied, and it's usually monkey. For general toxicity test, TK is required to see the relationship between um, clinical tests. Next is the reproduction and development toxicity testing. There are three. And as one, uh, sec one, sec one, uh, sec two, and sec three. And for the uh, general drugs, the bar depending on the birth control of women participating in the clinical trials, the type of uh, the type uh, applied can be different. If you look at the ICH guideline. depending on the uh, participants. The reproduction may be different. And when we have the pregnant woman, or there is a potential to include a pregnant woman in the clinical trial, then the SAC 2, the full data need to be obtained. If there is no birth control, then all the reproduction related data need to be included. So, SEC1 and SEC2 are required before phase 3 and before the marketing authorization, SEC3 data is needed. The SEC2 study here on the two species, including rabbit and rat, are needed. And when there is an NDA application, the data is needed. However, the SEC1 is not required. And for the cytotoxicity or the uh, anti-cancer drugs with the cytotoxicity, then for those type of uh, drugs or the drugs in the category known for the reproduction and developmental toxicity, the SEC2 is not required for NCE. The two types of the data is needed, but if there is a positive result from one uh, species, then the labeling will be just uh, positive. With a positive re uh, result, we don't have to do another study on the, uh, another uh, species. 
And another approach is that we can think of any other uh, approaches for the reproduction and developmental toxicity study. So you don't have to too much, uh, worry too much about this part. Next one is the genotoxicity. And for general drugs, before phase one and two, uh, there are two, two in vitro uh, studies and one in vivo before phase two. That's the general rule. But for the anti-cancer drug, the general toxicity uh, data need to be submitted before NDA. And therefore, uh, for N we uh, follow the ICHS6 and for the in vitro if the result is positive and if it's at, uh, ordinary drugs then we need to do in vivo again so that we should produce the data but for the anti-cancer drug if the in vitro testing uh, produce positive result then there is no need to do in vivo testing Next one is the carcinogenicity. And the carcinogenicity study is not required for the therapeutics intended to treat patients with advanced cancer. It seems to be quite obvious because it is important for that type of patients to treat the cancer. Existing cancer, the carcinogenicity is not an issue here. For other type of drugs, actually carcinogenicity data is not required for all cases. Only certain cases require the uh, carcinogenicity data at the time of the NDA, like uh, if the drug is used more than six months continuously, or even if it is used intermittently, if it's used regularly for a long term, uh, then the data need to be uh, provided. And if there is a, uh, a potential for the the two cancerous uh, lesion in the repeat dose toxicity testing, or if the same class drug has the carcinogenicity, if that is the case, then again, uh, the data is needed. So what it says is that only when necessary, the data is required. Next one is the immunotoxicity. If uh, there is a abnormality in lymph node or spleen and any other immune-related organs, then the immunotoxicity testing is required. And for anti-cancer drugs, immunotoxicity can be done as a part of general toxicity testing. And you know, for the immunomodulatory drug and in the general toxicity, this kind of a immunotoxic indicators can be included as one of the parameters in the general toxicity testing. Next one is the photo safety testing. According to the photochemical characteristics like light absorption or photostability, distribution tests on the skin and eyes are conducted for uh, usual uh, DP. And when it is needed, uh, the safety, uh, the photo safety study need to be done before the clinical uh, trial phase three. For anti-cancer drug, before phase one, the potential for the phototoxicity uh, is assessed. So the photochemical properties of the substance is identified and the information from the similar product or the pro uh, substance in the same class need to be included or reflected in. And if it is necessary to do the photo safety assessment, then the data need to submit it before NDA. So how it is used uh, in the clinical trial after the data is generated from the non-clinical phase. 
This is the start dose for first in human. In general, we set the start dose in order to ensure the safety for healthy volunteers. So Noel established in the anima model is multiplied by 10. So within that limit, usually the six type of doses are used in the escalation scheme. So, however, for the anti-cancer drug clinical trials, it is a little bit different from any other types of drugs because we do have the patients with tumors. So, we focus on the safety, but at the same time, uh, the dose need to be uh, to generate or deliver efficacy. So, all the preclinical data body weight and other uh, parameters including AUCs can be utilized but ma many times the, uh, the body surface area is very important parameter. For the biopharmaceuticals with immune agnostic property, the MABEL-based approach can be considered. And this is the uh, annotation uh, in the guideline for the rodents. Whether this caused 10 percent higher than 10 percent toxicity, the to toxicity in higher uh, more than 10 percent of the animal, and for the non rodent, rodent, the highest non severely toxic dose. And one sixth of that uh, is the start dose. As an example, from the experience, when we look at the approved anti cancer drugs, one third was established or as a recommendation. So this is the DES and the highest dose. In the clinic, non-clinical trial, usually the uh, maximum dose or the maximum exposure uh, uh, do not serve as the limiting factor for the clinical trials. The toxicity profile from the animal model need to be well predicted. That's the general rule for the drugs. But for the anti-cancer drug, you can see there is a very sharp slope and severe toxicity can be, can show uptake. And if that is the case, then we go for higher dose. And the dose, increasing dose pattern may dictate that we need to escalate the dose a much more gradual way. And in this guideline, I think the biggest difference from ordinary drugs and the anti-cancer drug is that when it comes to the non-clinical trials duration, phase one, two, three, you can see that these are the required non-clinical trial period. For the drugs that is used lesser than two weeks for the clinical trial, then for the rodents in the non-clinical, two weeks, non-rodents, two weeks. And you see that if the drug is used for more than six months for the clinical, then in the preclinical, for rodents, six months, non-rodents, nine months, and for from two weeks to uh, lesser than, shorter than six months, the period or the duration need to be equal to what is applied to the clinical trials. 
So usually we select patients who are eligible to the clinical trials. That's what we do. However, for the new drugs, the patients who are taking the new drug after approval, they are not well controlled. And that's why we require much longer duration of the non-clinical uh, trial data. And to repeat those is uh, the one time per day and seven times per week administration is usual schedule. But for the anti-cancer drugs, the administration scheme can be very various. So if it's once every three to four weeks in the clinical schedule, then non-clinical, the single dose data would be sufficient. And if it's daily for five days and the cycle is every three weeks, then for non-clinical, daily for five days would be sufficient and daily for five to six days for the alternating weeks and the, ta the same data or the schedule need to be applied to the non-clinical but with the two-dose cycle or if the schedule is once a week for three weeks with one week off for the non-clinical once a week for three weeks And if it's two to three times a week for clinical trial, then for the non-clinical, two to three times a week for four weeks. And if it's a daily schedule for the clinical trial, then the non-clinical treatment schedule would be daily for four weeks. So such and repeat those toxicity schedule, testing schedule would be fine. And if it's a weekly for a clinical, clinical schedule, then it would be once a week for four to five doses. So for a uh, schedule, it's applicable to NCE and NBE. So depending on the clinical uh, schedule, the non-clinical treatment schedule would be different. And one of the most frequently posted questions to me is that let's say this substance or the drug is administered weekly. And here it says once a week for five, uh, four to five doses. And usually the necropsy is done in order to see the effect. So if that is the case, when we do it for the general toxicity testing, the guideline says it's in the less than 24 hours for in anti-cancer drug, uh, anti drug uh, the treatment schedule is only mentioned in the guideline and therefore here after the final those or the administration the confirmation through autopsy can be decided when the toxicity can be well observed. For example, if, let's say if the CMAX is maintained from the first administration or it can change. So it, depending on the substance, the timing would be different. Like it can be peak in 24 hours or 36 hours and therefore uh, it should be done at the time when the toxicity of a specific substance can be well assessed. And more recently, uh, the once a week schedule would utilize four doses rather than five doses, but still it's case by case. And if there is a recovery arm, then uh, we will extend the observation period 
and those indicators or the parameters in the toxicity testing need to be well considered in deciding the duration. Phase one and phase two data would cover at least like one month and NDA and phase three for that we need to have three months repeat those toxicity testing data. So depending on the treatment response at the phase one, as I said, the non-clinical period would be about a month. So in the clinical trial, of course, it cannot be applicable to other drugs, but for the anti-cancer drug, uh, if there is a treatment response, then the administration can be extended and there is no need for the additional toxicity testing here. And if the toxicology data is not sufficient to justify the clinical study uh, schedule, then additional toxicity testing can be uh, done on one species of animal. Let's say we are targeting a certain cancer and in clinical study, there is only one possible schedule, like two administration a week. So if that is the case, the non-clinical study too has to apply that schedule as a protocol. However, we may change the target. So we need to do three administration per week. If that is the case, then we need to do additional toxicity testing. And early phase trial, only the scheduled duration of the administration can be allowed for any other drugs. And if the toxicological data is not supporting it sufficiently, uh, then there should be uh, the repeat dose toxicity study data required for non-rodent and rodent. And for the concomitant use with other drugs, basically the toxicology data is needed if a drug is used in concomitantly with others, but for the anti-cancer drug, it may be different. Let's say two drugs here are already approved one, so there are safety data enough. If that is the case, there is no need to produce further uh, toxicology data here. Uh, we just provide the justification for the concomitant use. However, the safety is not secured in one drug then non-clinical efficacy data need to be provided. And that's because when we do the efficacy testing, side effects is also observed. So we can see the differences between that data and the toxicity data. So it is not a must in this case to produce toxicity data. So based on this, we can decide whether we need to do the toxicity testing for the concomitant use. Next one is for pediatric population. It's quite similar to non-cancer drugs. In non-cancer drugs, the approach is that the safe dose is confirmed in the adult patient and then a portion of that dose is applied to the uh, pediatric population clinical trial. So existing non-clinical and clinical data are not sufficient. If that is the case, then the additional non-clinical is needed, utilizing a uh, young animal. But if not, it, this is not the case. 
Next is the other considerations. One is conjugated uh, products. The cytokine and the linkers are conjugated in this product. Here, usually, the targeted antibody is linked, and the linker here is new chemical many times. However, there is no need to produce safety data for this linker. However, in the toxicology data with this ADC, the conjugated material and unconjugated material, they need to be quantified and they need to be utilized in the data interpretation. And liposoma product is quite similar. The liposomal product itself does not require additional safety data. However, if not, if the safety is uh, obtained for the liposomal product, there is no need for the non-clinical data. But if not, the, uh, the drug need to be studied in the toxicology study on the liposomal data. And for the metabolite, for anti-cancer drugs, there is no need to do assess metabolite in non-clinical study. Even the even when the metabolite is discovered in human, there is no need. For impurities, ICHQ3A and B, the limit is identified as 0.15, so there is a requirement to show uh, the known issues with the uh, impurities. But here it is waived, and that's because even though there is a, a impurity to a certain extent, if the drug delivers sufficient benefit, and these can be waived. And you can see when uh, this can be allowed in the guideline. So if I summarize, basically, when we conduct a clinical study, there are many considerations to be made in the non-clinical study in accordance with the ICHM3 and S9. We need to decide the schedule, dosing schedule for non-clinical S9, small molecule and large molecule, both of them are covered. M3 is applied to small molecule. For IND submission, repeat dose study. P1, P2 for that. One month repeat dose study is needed for M3. Two weeks to three months. It should in accordance with the clinical study dosing schedule. For chronic repeat doses 3, in order to support three uh, phase 3 and NDA, for S9, it's 3 months. But for M3, for Vodans, 6 months. For non Vodans, 9 months. For the safety pharmacology studies, for S9 and the point in the repeat dose study, if they are combined and that is sufficient, but for M3, the vital signs, the individual study need to be done for each vital sign. And for general toxicity study in M3, in vivo, in in vitro need to be done for S9, if it is needed, then it can be submitted before NDA. For carcinogenicity, not required under S9, but under M3, it's required on two species before NDA. For reproductive toxicology study, for NDA, SEC2 is needed under S2, but M3 requires SEC2 and SEC3. 
for other uh, studies, impurities can be justified for phototoxicity before phase three, the data need to be submitted. That's what as nine dictates for M3, uh, phototoxicity is needed in phase one. Thank you very much, Ms. Jumi Kim. Now, regarding her presentation, we will take questions. Those who are uh, present um, on site, uh, we will first give you opportunity to um, raise your hand and ask a question. No questions from the floor? Any questions? Seems like there's no question from the floor. Um, do we have any questions uh, from remote participants? Well, the presentation was perfect, so there's no question. If there are any questions received later, we will respond to those questions later. Thank you once again very much, Director Kim.